Over 25% of all our energy is used in transport. The problem is that the emissions from burning fossil fuel in transport are slowly killing us. So I want to try to convince you that our attitude towards energy has really got to change. I know that energy is very accessible at the flick of a switch, but actually we need to use a lot less of it, or at least get it from a greener source. Basically, we've got to stop burning the dinosaurs, and we need to change our behaviour in how we decide to get from A to B. We all need and want mobility in a civilised society to transport goods, to mobilise the emergency services, uh, to access healthcare, for education, to get to work, to enjoy ourselves in our leisure time. Mobility is truly taken as the mark of a civilised society. Now, I reckon I travelled about 30,000 miles last year. That would be in commuting, business trips, holidays and leisure activities. And over my sort of limited lifetime, <laughs> um, that would be maybe about one and a half million miles in a lifetime, okay? So one and a half million miles. Now I don't know <clears throat> how many barrels of oil I've used, but it's a lot. And that's just for me. So I'd like to ask you to ask yourselves how far you think you travelled in the last 12 months and how much oil you burnt to do that. And then multiply that up by the global population. That's a lot of oil. We've seen an unprecedented increase in the global population. It's been nearly threefold in my lifetime. And I'm really not that old, and I'm not responsible either way. So, um, we're all consumers. We exploit resources. We buy stuff, and we want to move around. The, the world's population is increasingly city-based, so we have congestion in urban areas. That all uses vast amounts of energy. It generates emissions and air quality issues. Urban mobility, therefore, represents a significant challenge as the number of urban journeys increase. We reckon that about 20% of all the traffic driving around is just looking for parking space. Another 20% of city traffic is actually accessing healthcare services, people going to see their doctors, people going to hospitals, getting prescriptions. Um, Perhaps when they're going to the hospitals, they may even be going there to consult about some kind of respiratory-related problem. How ironic that would be. Now, our planet needs a blanket of gases around it to protect us from the direct effects of the sun and to give us a relatively stable climate. It would be very, very cold without that blanket of gas. These are the natural greenhouse gases. The problem is that we've been adding to that blanket um, from burning fossil fuel and that's been making things a little bit warmer. So this is what we call man-made global warming. The estimates for the increase in carbon dioxide levels are rather worrying. Um, emissions from transport alone have been rising at about 6% per year for the last 40 years. And that's despite all of the mitigation measures that have been taken so far, like all of the more efficient vehicles, still rising at 6% per year. Now, carbon dioxide levels have been monitored for a long time. In fact, a guy called Ralph Keeling has been measuring CO2 levels at the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii for probably 40 or 50 years. And the so-called Keeling curve records a steady increase in carbon dioxide levels of four parts per million per year, every year, year on year, 
currently it's at least 400 parts per million. If we don't do anything about that, it'll be 700 parts per million by the end of this century. Now, the 2050 Climate Change Act, which lots of governments signed up to, requires us to get back to levels of CO2 last seen hundreds of years ago. Frankly, I think that's impossible. Now, the focus of many governments has in fact changed from looking at CO2 to air quality because airborne pollution is being measured and the effects on health are becoming recognised. Tailpipe emissions from dirty old diesel engines are obvious, but petrol engine vehicles also emit all sorts of gases and particulates, they're just too small to see. And then there's the dust from the brakes and the tyres, because these components wear out. So local air pollution in cities is seen as quite a big problem. And that leads to the respiratory diseases, asthma and so on. Globally, we're told that there are over 5 million premature deaths per year from poor air quality. In the UK, it's reckoned to be over 50,000 premature deaths per year. You see, it's just killing us slowly. It's a little bit like passive smoking. Now, against that background, the world energy consumption could well treble by the end of this century, basically because it's linked to population and to affluence. If you've got money, you buy stuff, you move around, you commute, you go on holidays. Globally, most of our energy comes from fossil fuels, burning coal, burning gas, burning oil. Now, these fuels took millions of years to form. They will take just as long to replace, and yet we burn them in seconds. Now, we also have nuclear energy. It's apparently clean, but that's before we start to consider the long-term nuclear waste. Now, what we call renewable energy is the energy that occurs naturally and continuously in the environment, such as the energy from the sun, from the wind, from the waves, tidal flows, and so on. And these sources are basically inexhaustible, but they are intermittent in nature. So there's a growing demand for us to get renewables to be a much larger part of the energy mix. Um, currently, they're about 20% of the UK's electricity grid, but they really do need to be much more. So if we bring this all back to transport, how can we get from A to B in our cities? Well, of course, we'd encourage more walking and cycling. That would be good for us. We would encourage people to use public transport more. We could have intelligent transport systems. We could get real-time information about congestion so that we could avoid the bottlenecks. Um, we could reduce congestion and pollution with uh, fewer, more efficient vehicles. We could share vehicles. Most people who have a car barely use it for 5% of its life. So maybe we could rent out the other 95%, in effect, sort of Airbnb a car. Um, but better than that, perhaps, would be to imagine a monthly mobility card, like an Oyster card, just for city dwellers. A sort of go anywhere, use any form of transport you like, just for a monthly subscription. I think that would be a great idea to reduce congestion and utilise the resources which we are already using and have got out there. The general approach so far to, to clean up the air in our cities is to go electric. So why would you want to go electric? Well, because there are no tailpipe emissions, there's no pollution at source, and a nice bonus, it's quieter. The question is, where does the electricity come from? It's not magic. Um, you know, it comes from the grid. And so unless we have a much greener energy grid, 
the emissions are just transferred to the power station. So it's good for the city, it doesn't make much difference to the planet. In terms of personal mobility, the issue is weight. Heavy vehicles will always use a lot of energy, especially to go up a hill. And it doesn't matter whether they're electric or fossil fuel, they just use a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to move a heavy object. An empty car weighs around about one and a half tonnes. An empty double-decker bus, about 12 tonnes. So one person in a car is basically moving at least 20 times their own body weight. Basically, we're moving 20 times our own body weight just to get from A to B. The purpose of transport is to get from A to B, not to move all that material as well. So we're actually moving huge masses of material. It's very inefficient. And that's even before we talk about the efficiency of the modes of transport themselves. And this really matters if the energy that is used to move that transport is not renewable energy. So let's just think a little bit more about electric transport. A large battery electric vehicle, a BEV, is not going to save the planet. We need much smaller BEVs. Better still, smaller than that, a light electric vehicle, an LEV. So we go from BEVs to LEVs. Um, and those are great for sort of one or two people. Um, but better than that still would be to get onto two wheels, perhaps with an electric scooter or um, my favourite, the electric bicycle. And there's an example with me here. This is what we call a pedelec, a pedal-assisted electric bicycle. These things use tiny amounts of energy. They could probably be charged from the sun directly through a little solar panel. I give to you that this could be the ultimate transport option for cities. It's a bit like range-extended cycling. In effect, it's like cheating, and you don't need a licence to use it. One of the big problems of cycling is that if you cycle up a hill, it's hard work. If you're cycling into the wind, it's hard work. So you get hot and sweaty. Um, the beauty of this is this gets rid of the hills, it gets rid of the wind, and you don't even need to wear Lycra to drive it. Now, I know the Lycra thing's a personal choice. Um, you know, some people look quite good in Lycra, but, you know, hold that thought. Um, so what's the government done to encourage us to move around in a different, more sustainable way? Well, government policies and regulations are basically sticks and carrots. The sticks are taxes and charges. This very week, the toxic charge was introduced into London um, to penalise the older, more polluting vehicles. Um, we can reduce the amount of available parking spaces in city centres, so people are forced to find another way of getting there. And, of course, we can have one-way systems to redirect traffic away from the centre. And what are the rewards? What are the carrots? Well an improved public transport system. If you're going to stop people taking their own forms of transport into a city, you have to provide a viable option. So improved public transport, many cities have done that. You can provide specialised parking spaces just for electric vehicles, maybe even with a charging point in it. And we could have proper cycle paths. You know, the Netherlands have spent 20 times more on cycling infrastructure than the UK since the 1970s. No wonder people choose to cycle in the Netherlands. It's a very, very pleasant experience. So, how can personal mobility be maintained in future without burning so much fossil fuel? Well, we need a much greener electricity grid to make electric transport more credible. We need to reduce congestion by taking more vehicles off the road and we could go to a system of usership rather than ownership. And maybe in the future, autonomous vehicles will take us around 
that will actually reduce the number of individual vehicles on the road. I think perhaps more importantly than anything else is our behaviour. We've got to catalyse a change in behaviour to demonstrate the advantages of doing things differently and to make it fun. Now, electric cars are fast and they're fun. But our musical stairs, the way to make more of us think. The stairs here play a tune when they're walked on. And that's a kind of reward for not using the electrically powered escalator next to them. So at least they make us smile and maybe think a little bit about the energy that we're not using if we go up the musical route. So going back to the beginning of my talk, um, how far are you going to travel in your lifetime and how are you going to do it without burning so much fossil fuel? Thank you.